Prayer is the most powerful tool in our hands, in human hands. That you could use it to fight against any kind of enemy in your life. That there is no enemy that can stand against a prayerful person. We just saw in the book of James chapter 5, prayer of a righteous man is effective and powerful. If you come to, uh, to, to your knees, no matter how big the mountain is against you, it can come crumbling down if you can pray. Prayer is a powerful tool in our hands. This morning, I want to give you six reasons why you need to pray before we you know, start talking about the Lord's Prayer uh, together. Why do we need to pray? Number one, we need to pray because God commanded us to pray. We need to pray because God commanded us to pray. God would not tell us to do a meaningless act. He puts meaning into life, not futility. So if God asks us to do something, we know that there is some reason why he asks us to do that. If God did ask us to pray, it's, uh, he, he asked us to do that because uh, it can bring results. You know, for many of us, prayer is not a part of our daily life. We may read a five-minute devotion in our, on our phones. Now that Bible has become and all these Bible studies have become so accessible to us, we can do a five-minute devotion, but we never actually spend time on our knees and pray because we don't really believe. We may say we believe in the power of prayer, but we don't really take it seriously. God wouldn't have asked you to... To pray if prayer was not effective. He's not, in, he's, he's not going to let you be mocked at uh, because of your faith and your obedience in prayer. If God tells you to pray, then prayer has a value. Prayer um, is powerful because God commanded us to um, pray. We pray because God commanded us. Number two, we pray because God is glorified in it. Our prayer glorifies God. When we pray, what we are acknowledging is um, the sovereignty and superiority of God over everything in our lives. When we, when we uh, when we, uh, when we, when we uh, begin to say, God, your name be glorified, when we are lifting up his name and talk about him, we are exalting the name of God through our prayers. We are, prayer, prayer gives God's glory. Prayer, prayer gives God glory. Um, prayer tells us, tells the whole world that we believe in this God who is powerful, who is omniscient, uh, omnipotent, uh, uh, who is all-knowing, all-ever-present, uh, who is a God who provides, who is a God who fulfills the promises that he makes. God is glorified through our prayers. Prayer gives him glory of, uh, for, his, for his holiness. Prayer, gives him, prayer uh, gives him glory when we come to him and seek his wisdom. Prayer gives him glory when we come to, his, come to our knees and ask him for mercy and grace upon our lives. We should pray because God is glorified in it. Number three, we should pray because people need our prayers. We should pray because people need our prayers. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of, a poem goes like this. Wherefore let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within its brain? If knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer, both for themselves and, and those who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. 
the poem basically tells us this that if 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 you know we're not sheep and goat we are human beings and if i'm not going to god in prayer for myself and for others then what's the point of calling people our friends we need to pray because people need our prayers not only we we you know we require prayers from others we need to pray for others paul uh, the great apostle um writing to um, the churches that he writes every almost every single church he pleads with them to pray for him he says i am praying for you every time i remember you i thank god he writes to philippians he writes to colossians he says every time i think of you i thank god for you thank god for your faith i pray for you earnestly but you also pray for me pray for me that whenever i open my mouth he says uh, words may be given so that i fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which i am the ambassador in chains pray that i may declare it fearlessly as i should this uh, this great apostle is actually asking his church saying that would you please pray that i may preach well would you please pray that i may share the gospel well effectively would you please pray that when i stand up against people who are intimidating who want to kill me that i would be filled with courage to stand up against them and talk boldly about jesus we need prayer uh, for each other we need to pray for each other that's why prayer um, we need to pray we should pray because people need our prayers Number four, we need to pray. We should pray because we change as we pray. So one of the things about prayer is this: that prayer changes us. As we begin to pray for others, as we begin to pray for a change in in, in the lives of people, a process happens first in our lives. That's the beauty of prayer. somebody once t- told us this the fast the quickest way to change a bad relationship into a good relationship is to pray for that relationship that's the quickest way to do that every other strategy that we follow in order to change a bad relationship to good relationship will take time will may, may actually result in wrong uh, i know um, wrong uh, wrong ends but if we can pray any relationship can turn from bad to good paul writing to philippians in philippians chapter 1 talks about how to pray for people chapter 1 verses 9 to 11 is a, is a beautiful prayer if we all must memorize that prayer and pray for others paul's prayer uh, for his people would you just turn that and and look at it philippians chapter 1 um verses 9 to 11 i pray that your love will overflow more and more that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding for i want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of christ's return may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation the righteous character produced in your life by jesus christ for this will bring much glory and praise to god in this three verses he prayed this 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 prayer um that uh, that is extremely good prayer you know you can actually divide it into four parts this prayer this three verses into four parts what is praying first he say i pray that you may be filled with the love of god the first thing that i want to see in a relationship or in a person uh, for whom i'm praying is this that i want to see that person be filled with christ because that's what changes people the love of christ if for any person if they encounter the love of christ in in, in its purest form they cannot remain same something happens in their life something begins to change inside them So he says I want to pray I pray that you may be filled with the love of Christ you may know Christ 
Then he says, I pray that you may be filled with the knowledge and understanding. He's saying, I, may, I pray that you may be filled with wisdom of God. First of all, I pray that you may be filled with Christ so that, uh, with the love of Christ so that you may have the right faith. But I also pray that you may have the wisdom of God in your life so that you may know what is right and what is wrong. What is God, godly and what is from devil. He's actually praying for people and he's saying, that's my prayer for you. That you may know what is coming from God, what is not coming from God. Then he says, I pray that you may have pure and blameless lives. That's the third prayer, right? That's the third thing he prayed for. I pray that you may have pure and blameless life. So first have the right faith. Uh, be filled with the love of God by be filled, being filled with the love of God. Then have the right wisdom so that you know what is from God, what is not from God. I also pray that you make right choices in your life. It's a very important thing. Huh? Not, it's, it's, it, while it is important for us to know what is from God, what is not from God, it is also important for us to make the right choice. Some of us know what is right and what is wrong and still make wrong choices. So he's saying, when, I, I pray that church, that not only you know what is right and what is wrong, what is godly and what is from evil, uh, what is evil, but I pray that you may actually make good choices, right choices, godly choices. That way you will become pure and blameless. Now what happens after that? He says this, I pray that through your life, as you produce the right fruit, you may bring glory to Christ. Have right faith, that's my prayer for you, that you may be filled with the right faith, that you may have the right wisdom, that you may make right choices, and that you may bring right fruit out of your life. A fruit that will bring glory to God. What a prayer it is. Huh? If you don't know how to pray for people, this is how you pray. You know, sometimes some of us want to pray for others, we just don't know how to pray for them. Once we, uh, you know, finish up the list of the needs that they told you, like sickness or, or like a job, or you, you just don't know how to pray after that, right? This is how you pray. Pray that they may be filled with the love of God. Pray that they may be filled with the wisdom of God. Pray that they may live their lives blameless and, and pure. Pray that they may produce the right fruit that will bring glory to God. Now when you begin to do that, something begins to happen in your own personal life. You see, the way God changes a bad relationship into a good relationship, the way God changes a bad person is, is by making you the person who will influence him to become good. Prayer has the power to change us. You may not see it, but it actually brings change. See, some of us struggle to pray, submit to, it, submit to its disciplines, respond to the call of uh, God. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and because sometimes we don't see results happening quickly. And the, consequently, we lose interest in our prayers. Interest in the time that we need to set aside for God and you know, spend time with Him. True is, the, the truth is this. Even though you may not see it, God is at work in your life. That the little time that you actually spend with Him is bringing fruit in your life. You may not see it right now. In the, in the three years of Bible school that I studied in, uh, when, I, when I was studying for my theology, it was the last six months in my Bible college that I actually spent time asking God, God, would you just direct my life? That helped me to make choices that are your will. That I may, I may emotionally be attracted to do some things, but always kind of course correct me, God. Bring something into my life, bring situations into my life that even though I would not like, I would still make the correction and walk into your will. I prayed that prayer for six months. I was, I was in love with the wrong woman, a wrong person. Um, 
Janet is not here, so I can say anything I want today. <laughs> Um, I, I was making a wrong choice with regards to where I'm going to go and do ministry. I would have messed up my life. But I prayed those six months. This is what I prayed. Honestly, I prayed, God, I will make some choices because of emotional, you know, my emotions are because of attraction. But let me not mess up my life. Bring something into my life that will knock me out of wrong direction into right direction. Even if I don't like it. And when God did bring course corrections, I didn't like it. It was not something I asked, you know, I wanted. But I knew it was something God wanted to do in my life. I know that that six months of my prayer, asking earnestly, God, please help me to stay in your will. Help me to stay in the will of God today. Prayer changes us. Little by little, you may not know that, but it actually changes us. That's why we should pray. Number five, we should pray because things change when we pray. Things change as we pray. You may not know, you may not know this, that not only prayer brings transformation in your life, even if it is not visible right now to you, but your prayer actually makes things happen. Archbishop William Temple used to say like this, people tell me that the answers to prayer are merely, merely coincidences. I can only reply that when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I stop praying, they stop happening. I heard about a story um, that took place in, um, in a place called Dunstable in, in, uh, in UK. This place uh, was experiencing a series of brutal attacks and rapes uh, that were carried out by, by a criminal who came to be known as the Fox in the popular press because of, uh, because of the skill that he had in evading the police, you know, from being caught. Eventually, the local church, the, the, there's a, you know, a church that was in, in Dunstable, began to pray together. They began to hold special prayer meetings and, and pray for the capture of this criminal. They prayed specifically, they prayed forcefully, they prayed persistently. Soon, um, the, you know, um, the fox was captured and, and the picture appeared on the, on the papers of this particular criminal handcuffed between two policemen. The interesting thing is this, that both these policemen were the members of that church. There are no coincidences in God's dictionary. I'm sure when that picture appeared, God must be looking at all the people who call the results of our prayers as coincidences. You must be looking at them and smiling. Do you call it coincidence now? When you pray, Things change. People change. Circumstances can be changed. We should pray because things change as we pray. Number six, and this is the premise of the entire series, we should pray because Jesus prayed. That's why we pray. We should pray because Jesus prayed. If the Son of God in our world needed to pray, do you think you need not? That you would not require to pray? That did you actually think that you can survive as a Christian, make choices that are good, make choices that are godly, that you could, that you could actually be successful and be happy at both at the same time without actually praying? That's not going to happen. You may be successful, but you will not be happy. You may have, you may accumulate everything that you want in your life, but you would still not be happy. Without prayer, no person, I don't think there is any successful Christian in this world because Jesus himself showed that pattern uh, that, that in order to fulfill the purpose of God in our lives, we must learn to pray. His prayer life focused on his sense of dependence 
and obedience to God. He had, spe he had, you know, he was specialized in uh, prolonged times of prayer. Sometimes he would minister the whole day, uh, heal people the whole day, preach the whole day, days together, and yet in the night when everybody's gone to sleep, he would go up to the top of the mount or find a place that is lonely in the wilderness and start praying. He knew this, that his time with the father is the one thing that can prepare him to face his, 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 the business that he has in his hand. You want to be successful at your office, you need to pray. You want to be successful in your marriage, you need to pray. You want to be successful in your exams, you need to pray. Because Jesus did that. And we got to learn from him. Before and after his baptism, before choosing the 12 disciples, before the transfiguration, even in the garden of Gethsemane, before his passion and death, Jesus spent time in prayer. In fact, he did not stop praying. Even now, after his ascension to the heaven, he is now sitting on the right side of the Father. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, he say, the author says he's now sitting beside the Father and interceding for you and for me. Still praying. Still praying for you and for me. That we may actually be overcomers, conquerors in this world. So if Jesus prayed, we must learn to pray. That's what uh, disciples uh, realized. If Jesus is praying, we must learn to pray. So they walk up to Jesus. This, the Lord's Prayer, so often recited in churches and uh, at religious events in our church, um, um, sometimes can, be, can become so ritualistic to us, we don't actually know, see the true meaning of this prayer. It's not a mantra. I want you to know this. Disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. They didn't say, teach a prayer. You got the difference, right? They didn't ask for a mantra that they can repeat again and again and again. They asked him, teach us to pray. So Jesus, when he taught them this, he's not teaching them a prayer. He's teaching them how to pray. This is, this is the structure to pray. This is, this is like the pattern to follow. This is like the model of praying. This prayer. This prayer um, is, is as in the first look itself, you know it's, it's, it's two parts, right? The first part, the first three things focus on God. The second three things focus on us. Focus the first three things talk about the name of God, the kingdom of God and the will of God. While the second three things talk about the food that we need, the forgiveness that we need, the holiness that we need in our lives. The first talking about God, second our needs. The, the, the you know, simple division of this prayer. When we come to this series, we'll do more exposition. Of, of this passage, but I just want to leave you with six things that we can learn from the Lord's Prayer so that we can also pray like Jesus. Today we'll look at three, we'll come back next week and look at the next three. Is it okay? The first three we will look at. Number one, the first thing that I could learn from this prayer is this, this is what Jesus is teaching us. When you pray, connect with God relationally. When you pray, Connect with God relationally. How did he start? Our Father in heaven. What a privilege it is for us as Christians. That, that we could actually go to God and call him Father. God isn't interested in, 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 in us practicing religion. Instead, he desires a relationship with us in this prayer. That's what Jesus made clear to us. He's not worried about how many times, how many Sundays in a year you have attended the church, how many uh, communions you've been part of, or uh, you know, how many people you actually went out and witnessed. He's not counting all that. Of course you need to do all that. He's not counting all that. 
He's not looking at how ritualistically you're following your religion. He's actually more interested in developing a relationship with us. In fact, he gave us the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit would help us to connect with him like that, like a father and a child. In Romans chapter 8, verses 15, Paul says, So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Because of that, now we call him Abba, Father. God loves relationships. That's why even in prayer, Jesus wanted us to connect with God as a father. Let me make an interesting observation for you. God is called Father only 15 times in Old Testament, 14 or 15 times in Old Testament. The entire Old Testament, God is addressed as a Father maximum of 15 times. Never has He been addressed as a Father in a prayer in the Old Testament. But in the, when you come to the New Testament, you would see that God is called as a father 65 times only in Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark and Luke, that's it, the first three. 100 times in the Gospel of John. Father, did you see what Jesus did? He changed the way we connect with God now. Nobody before Jesus, any Jew wouldn't even dare to call God Abba. God, it's, it's God, Jehovah, the Adonai. You can't call God Abba. And Jesus changed that. There's, he brought a shift in the way that we relate with God. In 1 John, that's why John says in 1 John, John sorry, John chapter 1 verse 12, Gospel of John 1, chapter 1, verses 12. But as, but as many as received him, that is Christ, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. So if I believe in Jesus and come to God, now my relationship with God, the dynamic of my relationship with God is changed. He is father and I'm, and I'm a son because he adapted me. The fact that God is our dearest father is the foundational awareness in prayer. Wrapped up in this expression, our father is a new dimension in intimate communion with God. The same intimacy that exists between a child and a father is now exists between you and God. If you have a child, any one of you, if you're married and you have a child, you know the connection you have with your child. You know how you feel, uh, how, uh, you know, when they call upon you. But he did not stop there, right? He did not just simply say, our father. He added something else, our father in heaven. While he did define our relationship with, with God, He's also making sure that we are reminded of this fact that while he's your father, he's also God. Remember that. He's a sovereign God. That uh, while, while you do, while you can connect with, with, with him as a father, don't take him for granted. He's God. We may address God as the dearest father, but we should do it with deepest reverence, sense of wonder. Nobody could put it better than this, this tribesman in Nigeria who for the first time heard the gospel. And, uh, and um, as, as this missionary began to explain uh, what Christ has done and the kind of relationship now is established through Christ between people and God. He, this, this, this chief tribesman stands up because for, for him all this while, God is something super, super, you know, super natural and something that you can't really connect with and something that needs to be feared of. Um, the, 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 
animistic religion taught them to be in fear of their gods. Now when they had this experience of, uh, of, of accepting Jesus into their personal life and knowing that, that now they are connected to God through, through, through Jesus, this is what he says, behind this universe stands one God, not a great number of warring spirits, as we have always believed, but one God. And that God loves me. I, I, I wanted to be there, you know, when I first read this expression, I, I wish I had been there when this, the, this tribesman actually said that. I could imagine the joy on his face. All this while he was, he was confined to, you know, this, this belief that you, you must be in fear of God, you, you cannot look at God, you, you know, and then now, because of Christ, he's got this freedom to connect with God. Sometimes when we come to church, well, I'm jumping ahead of my second point, but let me connect there. Sometimes when we come to church and actually sing songs, Our Father, God in Heaven, or recite this prayer, there's no joy on our faces. I wonder what happened to that? What happened to that, that joy? And because of the absence of that joy, of knowing that you are now connected to God, you miss the second one. That is to worship Him in reflection. This is what Jesus taught us. First, through His prayer, connect with God relationally. Number two, worship His name reflectively. Worship, I was talking to a uh, plug-in two days ago. Uh, in our plug-in, I talked about Nehemiah's worship and how Nehemiah, mm, you know, at the dedication of the Jerusalem wall, um, you know, divided the entire group, the Levites and priests and scribes into two choirs and told them, hey, before we do the dedication of the wall, we better worship God. And he sends them out all around the city, covering all the gates and, you know, tells them, bring the best of your, uh, your instruments and begin to worship God and, and lift up his name because this is what he did for us. It was an act of reflection on who his God is. For most of us, worship is more about singing four songs. For 90% of our church, I can give that guarantee. Worship is that, okay, the first 40 minutes that I can come late. Just before, five minutes before the message, if I'm there, that's enough. I finished my church. That's what it is. Worship is all about that part. The songs that we sing, the music that we play. That's why worship becomes boring. Worship becomes mundane. What we don't realize is this, worship is reflecting on who God is. The time that you actually take here in, in His presence and begin to, begin to lift up his, his, your voices and begin to lift up your hands and begin to sing, you're actually taking time to reflect on who this God is. Hallowed be your name. It's not that his name needs to be, you know, purified. That's not what it means when you say, hallowed be thy name. It actually is, you know, declaring that God, your name is a part. You are a part. We recognize that, that you are a holy God. We treat you as a holy God. That's what we do in our worship. We are supposed to do in our worship. So Jesus taught us, uh, when Jesus taught us to pray, hallowed be your name, he's telling us, hey, make the presence of God real in your hearts. When you begin to sing, understand that you're not simply singing a song, you're offering your heart 
you're offering your life to a God who gave it all for you. You see, listen, um, if, if you did not listen to anything that I taught you today, just listen to this one thing. Hopefully I will achieve my goal today. Our worship must be reflective about Him and reflective of Him. Reflective about Him by recognizing and acknowledging and declaring who He is and who He is for us. Reflective of Him by proclaiming and living according to, the, to what we proclaim of Him. I want you to think through this. It's a solemn thought to realize that the failure on our part to hallow the name of the Lord has disastrous consequences. In causing the name of, uh, you know, the, the name by which you live, that name to be blasphemed by the world. You cannot call yourself a Christian. That's what I mean when I'm, when I'm making this statement. You cannot call yourself a Christian and don't live by that name. If you don't, then the whole world will blame Christ, not you. Will blaspheme Christ, not you. You are safe. You're making money, you're still growing, you're doing whatever you want. What is getting blasphemed is the name of God by which you are living. Paul says that in Romans chapter 2 verses 24. The name of God is blasphemed among Gentiles because of you, he says. So, we worship, true worship is reflective, reflection about him, at the same time reflective of him. That's true worship. So Jesus, Jesus by saying, by teaching us, by, by saying this, hallowed, by, hallowed be your name, he's telling us, worship his name with reflection. Number three, the third one. Pray for his, his agenda first. Respectfully pray for his agenda first. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What basically Jesus taught us is this, that the part of being a child of God is about what he cares about. He's caring about what he cares about. Our prayers are usually about ourselves, right? It's all about what we want God to do for us. What Jesus taught us is, that's not how you pray. You pray that his will be done first. That his kingdom come first. That is the priority. His message on the earth was primarily about his kingdom. Over, over a hundred times in the gospels, Jesus refers to the kingdom. So it's not surprising that when he taught his followers how to pray, he, uh, he taught them the first order of business in prayer is to pray for his kingdom. So we enter into his presence through hallowing his name and then we start telling him, God, we affirm the priority of God's rule over our lives and over everything in this earth. You see, in that, um, when you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, you're doing two things. First, you're saying, I'm recognizing that God is the ruler of my life. That's what you're saying. I recognize that God owns me. He is the king of my life. I mean, you're actually saying that. You're actually acknowledging it. Number two, when you're saying your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, sorry, when you're saying your kingdom come, you're also saying this, God, we understand 
that my first job is to take your kingdom out to the people who are not in, the, in this kingdom. That the gospel must be spread, that the kingdom of God must be established. How many of us, we actually do that every day? I mean, forget about every day, on a Sunday. Just one day. Right at the, at the end of the service, in a few minutes from now, you're going to, of course, do this, right? Uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What did you do about his kingdom? In the last six months, we finished six months, right? Seventh month right now. In the last six months, show me one Sunday that you actually did something about his kingdom. Then what's the point of praying? So when you're saying your kingdom come, you're also, you're saying that God, I understand you are my ruler, but what have you done to take his rule to the people who are still not in his kingdom? All I'm asking you is this, have you shared gospel to somebody? That's what I'm asking. At least on a Sunday, forget about all the six days of the week, next six days. Have you done something with your life that his kingdom may actually come to this world, this, this world? So part of being a follower of Christ is to care about what he cares about. Part of being a follower of Christ is also to do whatever he wants us to do. That's what he meant when he said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unfortunately, um, that while uncounted millions have repeated this word, your will be done, they have, they have, they did it without faintest notion of what it means. Perhaps even more alarming is this, that more people have repeated these words without any intention or whatsoever to do it. It could be possible that for the last 12 years, if you have been part of 12 years of Capstone, that you repeated this prayer again and again, or maybe for, uh, you know, for, for your life as a Christian, you have repeated this prayer again and again, your will be done without even intending to do it. Did you know when you say your will be done, you are not asking God to change his will, neither are you asking God to bless your will, you are asking him to help you to find and do his will. Did you know that? When you say your will be done, you're actually saying, God, I don't know what your will is, let me find it. If I know your will is, let me help, help me to do it. Think about what we are saying, or what we are even implying that, we are, we, or what we are implying is this, that um, God, in order to accomplish your will in my life, overturn my will. That's what you're saying to God. It's a dangerous prayer, huh? Today, don't repeat the prayer if you're not intending to do that. Your will be done means I have an intention to follow your will, God, even if it means overturning my will. Even if it means, you know, course correcting myself and coming to your will, even if I don't like it. To pray, your will be done means we understand that the prayer is not about God getting God on my page. It's about me getting onto his page. That's what it means. Let me close with this. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever thought about what does it mean as it is in heaven? In heaven, the will of God is done instantly, constantly, without failure. Think about this, okay? His will, if God wants to do something in heaven, it's done immediately. It's not done after 
30 years. After I get married, God. After I get a job, God. After I make money, God. That's not when it happens. It happens instantly. Some of you have a call of God on your life. He's been calling you to serve him. But you're like, let me make some money and then I'll think about it. But the will of God in heaven is done instantly, constantly, not one time, not two times, instantly, constantly, without failure. So don't pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven if you're not intending to do that instantly, constantly, without failure. So he taught me three things, right? The first three things are what? Connect with God relationally. Worship his, na worship his name reflectively. Pray for his will. Um, agenda first, respectfully. Pray for his agenda first, respectfully. Why did he do that? Let me close with that. Why did he do that? That's a big idea today. Why did he teach us that? Teach us that part is this. He's trying to tell us, it all depends, your entire life depends on who you depend on. It all depends on who you depend on. So therefore, better depend on the right person. That's what he's trying to teach us. God comes first. Because your entire life depends on him. Every, all your dreams depend on him. Your success depends on him. Your happiness depends on him. Your joy depends on him. Your marriage depends on him. Your children depend on him. Their future depends on him. So God comes first. I pray that next time when you repeat this prayer, that you truly pray like Jesus, because Jesus did make God's agenda first, the priority in his life. That in your business, in your marriages, in your decisions, may God come first. May God come first, because your life depends on who you depend on. Let's close our eyes.